Okay, we're all back. So, just to remind ourselves, right, we see that Malinowski embeds himself inside of Trobriand society, and by virtue of his participant observation, being in the middle of them, learning their language, learning their customs, becoming friends with, or becoming acquaintances, at least with many of the people with whom he's, around whom he's living, is able then to observe uh, features of the society that would be otherwise invisible uh, to outsiders, and is able then to discover certain things which is even invisible to themselves. That's the nature then of the coolery. So let's just take a couple of, uh, let's take a look at a couple of the characteristics of the society, and we're going to explore, explore these, and you'll see that they matter in terms of putting together, assembling uh, the bigger picture. First thing to point out is that we're looking at a cluster of islands, you can see here in the inset map, that's at the far east of Papua New Guinea. For those of you who are at home, I remind you that you have these slides available for download off the campus online. So we're looking at a cluster of islands on the far east of Papua New Guinea, uh, the main island of which is Kiriwina, which in the middle of it has this large lagoon, there's a number of other islands that are arrayed around the lagoon, and then there's a series of outer islands. Uh, uh, to get to which you have to then cross open ocean. And it was these journeys, for example, from Kiriwina to Kitava Island that caught the attention of Malinowski. Why engage in this dangerous trip uh, for apparently no particular purpose? The population is not particularly large, probably around maybe a little bit under, maybe a little bit over 10,000 people. It's hard to say. By the time Malinowski arrived, uh, the presence of European uh, colonialists or colonists in Papua New Guinea was already making itself felt. There were plantations drawing out uh, populations from these islands to work on plantations. So it's not entirely clear exactly how many people they were, there were, but not, we're not talking huge numbers, maybe the size of a, small, of a small city. And they lived in small villages of maybe 40, 50 people all across these islands, right? So they were everywhere in the jungle, in the, in the rainforest here, there were various small villages clustering people, 40 and 50 people or so, and maybe the villages would be not too far apart from each other, but not all clustered together. So they're sort of scattered, scattered throughout. That is to say that you were living in one village, you would have contact with your neighbors, but it wasn't the kind of, they weren't so close that it was very frequent necessarily. Uh, okay, so we're gonna explore then three features of, uh, of Trobriand or society uh, in, in turn. The first is, and it's, this is quite unusual, is that it was a patrilocal, matrilineal system. And if you recall from our lecture on the Huron, you should know what those terms mean. Patrilocal meaning that when people get married, the wife follows the husband. So the wife moves to where the husband is located. So in this sense, we have patrilocality. The matrilineality, on the other hand, refers to the line of descent, kinship, identity, property, and so on. So who you are depends on who your mother is, not on who your father is. So property, for example, is handed down across the mother's line, as is clan identity. The clan to which you belong depends then on the clan of your mother. So we have patrilocal matrilineality. And as we'll see, as a result of this system, something very unusual emerges at the most granular level of Trobriander economic life. The second point to note is the system of, or the interlattice system of hierarchy and social rank. So as we know from some of the readings that we've done already, in systems, in societies like this, it's fairly typical that you'll see inequality emerge. Inequality meaning that you'll have some kind of a hierarchy inside the society because you have people contributing resources inside the society for redistribution. There's always a point in that society, the focal point for redistribution, and the person who manages that, let's call them manage, we'll, we'll use the BBA terminology, the manager therefore has a higher position in the hierarchy. So the same is true here in the Trobriander village system. There's a local hierarchy in each village called a headman by Bra uh, Malinowski, somebody who's a, sort of responsible as it were for uh, for the coordination of resource management, adjudicature of disputes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Malinowski tells us that the people in the local hierarchy were often what he calls nothing more than prima, uh, primos inter pares, first among equals. So there was nothing in the position of the village headman that necessarily gave you access to a lot more power than anybody else. So it's maybe a hierarchical system, but it's not distinguished by sharp uh, asymmetries of authority. 
By contrast, there's a social rank system that's pervasive across the society, which is that there are a series of clans, again, similar to what we saw in the Huron reading. Uh, the clans are totemic, meaning that the clans correspond to certain symbols. We saw that in the Huron, they were also totemic. They corresponded to animals, beaver clan, whatever. Um, so here it's like these totemic clans, clans that are linked to certain things, artifacts. I believe they're geographic locations, actually. And depending on which clan you're in, you may have more or less social rank than people in other clans. So it's not, they're not all equal. Some are ranked higher, some are ranked lower. A bit like a caste system. So based on the clan, that's your social status. And so the degree of authority of any individual trobriander then depends on the combination of their standing inside of the local hierarchy and their social rank. Someone who comes from a relatively low social rank, <coughs> excuse me, clan, can attain a position in the hierarchy but have very little power. Whereas if you come from the highest ranked clan and you rise to the local hierarchy in the village, at that point you can, ar you can amass quite a lot of power. So all this to say that we see uh, wealth divisions, power, uh, sorry, inequalities distributed across the society based on the interplay of these two systems, right? So it's two forms, as it were, of creating inequality. And when those come into sync, like a wave function, they amplify, and at that point, you start to see certain people who acquire considerably more power, wealth, and authority than others. Then we'll come back to how that works in a, in a bit. Finally, Malinowski points us to, and, not, and admittedly, this is not in the part of the book that I've asked you to read, but he points our, our attention to the importance of magic and rituals he does allude to it in the chapter that we're reading, but in the rest of the book, he talks extensively about the importance of magic and social rituals across many features of Trobriander life. And we're going to turn our attention to a point made by Mouse in, an, in one of the other readings from Module 2 on the gift, where he talks about the Trobriander society and the meaning of these rituals to Trobriander life. And it's interesting because it's an example of a series of social rituals or, or magic, kind of the same, playing a vital economic role inside of the society. So we'll see that all three of these actually contribute to a certain economic portrait inside of Trobriander, inside of Trobriander society. This is from um, Malinowski's work. It's not from the chapter that I asked you to read. It's from the previous chapter. Um, and I should note that if you're interested in this topic, the book itself has long been in public domain. It was published in 1922, I think. So you can go and get, grab a copy for yourself if you like. Anyway, let's take a look at, what he, at, at certain features of the local economy that Malinowski points our attention to. He notes that there's a curious, um, there's a curious feature of how Trobrianders work. Now remember that at the time that Malinowski is writing this, the traditional or the sort of uh, pretty dominant European way of understanding, quote unquote, the savage or the native, was that they were lazy, uh, superstitious people who didn't work hard, etc. That's the kind of prejudice that we see operating here. So one of the reasons why it's written in the way that it is, is for Malinowski, as it were, to push back against that, that prejudice. You'll see that he says that the Trobriander works prompted by motives of a highly complex social and traditional nature, and towards aims which are certainly not directed toward the satisfaction of present wants. This goes directly against what most sort of the, the, the prevailing anthropological view was of, of a primitive, quote unquote, primitive people. Um, and the point that he's making is that Trobriand Islanders working in their gardens worked far harder than apparently they needed to because living in the kind of conditions that they did, food was plentiful, there were pigs running around in the, in the rainforest, so it was, there was plenty of food available. They worked far harder to raise food in their gardens than was necessary in order to provide what they needed, both in terms of their own daily survival as well as the obligations that they owed to others. And Malinowski notes that a common feature of Trobriander life is that they grow a lot of food which ends up rotting in the jungle. So it's simply they produced and then discarded. Why would they do this is the question. And the answer that Malinowski provides us comes in the last part of the sentence. He says, Work and effort, instead of being merely a means to an end, are, in a way, an end in themselves. Hard work is its own reward, we like to say. A good garden worker in the Trobriand derive a direct prestige 
from the amount of labor he can do and the size of garden he can till, the title Tokwai Bagula, I don't think I pronounced that correctly, which means good or efficient gardener, is bestowed with discrimination and born with pride. So the idea is that you work hard in your garden, you produce all of these goods, yams mostly, cassava, bananas, etc. And then you put them on display. And they, the Trobrianders had a kind, of, um, like a kind of a cabinet. It was a very large cabinet. You'd put it up and you'd, you'd array all of the stuff that you'd grown to make it visible. And people would walk around. And if you had a lot of shit in your cabinet, they'd be like, look at this guy. This, is, this guy knows how to garden. He's this word, talk why bagula, right? In other words, there's a value to the public display of your efforts. And that public display maps onto social prestige. So it was worth it, in other words, to commit this effort in order to gain the social prestige that came with it. As he says, this title is bestowed with discrimination. Not everybody gets to be called by this name. And once you're called by that name, once you have that reputation, you bear it with pride. It's a, it's a matter of pride that you are, you are seen in this way. So we see then that there's this idea of effort, effort that goes outside of what we would traditionally interpret as a kind of utilitarian um, environment to implicate other aspects of the society. In fact, we might call it a social utilitarianism, the utilitarianism that comes out of earning prestige and favor. The second point that he makes is that the surplus that is produced then by the, the uh, Trobriand uh, gardeners, the Trobriand farmers, as he says here, all the fruits, almost all the fruits of his work, and certainly any surplus which he can achieve by extra effort, doesn't go to him. It goes to somebody else. It goes to his relatives-in-law, and it goes to the chief as tribute, right? partly as due to his sisters or mother's husband and family. So here is this person working hard, and he gains no, none of the fruits or very little of the fruits of his own labor. So you grow all this stuff, and then you immediately move it on. So it seems like a very counterintuitive way of thinking about things. You can see that the first thing that comes out of this is that the notion of property rights, as we understand them within the paradigm of, say, a modern or Western way of thinking about it, is clearly modified or modulated, shall we say, in this way. The idea of property is inflected in a very different way in the context of Trobrian society. The second thing to note very quickly and keep in mind, and we'll come back to it, is this idea that he owes part to his sister, but also you'll see tribute to the chief, right? So when you grow stuff, there are, as it were, social claims that are already being made against what you are producing. But the one thing that's clear is very little of your effort is for producing for yourself. Very, very counterintuitive system. Well, how can we explain, uh, explain this finding? And we can explain it with reference to the matrilin patrilocal matrilineality or the matrilineal patrilocality, whatever you would like to call it. Okay, how did this work? It's a very, very curious system. What, the, what we see in the Trobriand society is a splitting up or a dividing of what would be the normal, or to our minds, quote unquote, normal uh, system of pairing at the most basic level, namely the household level. Right? So if we go to the most granular level of the economy, household production, we see a curious division that takes place. In our society, the reproductive pair and the economic pair are coincident. Husband and wife get together, they reproduce with each other, they also bring in wealth into the household for the purpose of allowing the household to flourish, right? That's the way all of our, or pretty much, all of our households work. So we make these two coincident. But under the patrilocal matrilineal household economy practiced by the uh, Trobriand Islanders, these pairings are split. So there's a re reproductive pairing between a wife and a husband that then is made distinct from, or exists distinctly from, the economic pairing, which is between a brother and a sister, or between a woman and her nearest male relative. And the way this works then, is that you have a reproductive consequence as a result of the pairing, right, so children, but the economic responsibility of the husband inside the reproductive pair does not redound to his own children, but instead, to the household, including the children, of his sister. So he goes out every day into the garden, produces food, and the food that he produces, in large measure, goes to supporting her household. That's where her food comes from. That's how she is supported. 
That's how her children are supported. And it's not just at the level of economic production, but also at the level of things like uh, the child rearing, that the brother is then takes on this responsible, we would call it paternal role, in the raising of his sister's children. So he's playing, as it were, a paternal role for people over whom he does not have paternity. And that same consequence applies in this context, meaning that his own children, he has only a very limited paternal role. So it's a very strange system, if you think about it, once we split up the reproductive and the economic pairing or the economic logic inside of the household. Now think for a moment, what kind of an economy does this produce? We've th this is just two households, right, to demonstrate or to illustrate the relationship. But in order for this to work, what kind of an economy are we talking about? What would it look like? Who wants to guess? Like circle? Circular, very good. Circular economy. Otherwise, you'd have people who are left out at either end of the chain, presumably feeling pretty unhappy, like, hey, how did I get this, this, this raw deal? So for it to work, and remember, we're talking about at the household economy level in small village units of not that many people. So in order for it to work, there has to be a kind of implicit circularity to it, right? So wherever we start in the chain, the chain gets finished up. And so this system of interlocking males and females, both at the reproductive and at the economic level, they create a kind of, this, they create this sort of, um, this sort of knot, system of knots, right, that connects everybody together. So all this to note that at the most granular level, at the household economy level, in Trobriander society, we have this principle of a circular economy working. And this makes sense then, right, based on that system of patrilocal matrilineality. The husband, or sorry, the, 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 the reproductive pairing connects, or is formed, so the, the female moves in with the male, right? So she's relocated to, the, to her husband. But remember, she, it's matrilineal. So her children and her property all follow her line. Therefore, the person who has more at stake in terms of contributing to her overall prosperity is not her husband, but her brother. So when the brother is essentially working for her, what he's doing is he's respecting that matrilineal logic of inheritance, patronage, etc., being distributed through the female line. And similarly, when he gets married to her, he's nonetheless interested in his own sister's welfare because of that matrilineal logic. So that combination of a patrilocal but matrilineal system creates the possibility for this otherwise quite unusual circular economic system that we find at the very heart of the household economy inside Trobriander society. Let's take a look then also at the system of uh, hierarchy. So we have this idea, right, that there are social ranks and political hierarchies. The political hierarchy is at the village level. So one, the headman in the village, the person who has a little bit more authority than others for the purposes of coordinating uh, distribution of surplus production, etc. Then we also have some people who, by virtue of the family into which they are born, have, by tradition, more social standing than others. And we observe that when those two connect, like a wave function coming together, there's an amplification uh, factor. So let's see how that works. And you'll see that it picks up on this idea of patrilocal matrilineality. So Malinowski tells us that when a headman of rank, meaning when somebody rises to the position of the headman of a village, who also comes from a high social rank, this he calls a headman of rank, this Malinowski then defines as a Trobriander chief. That's the word that he uses. It's not the word they use, obviously, but he calls them a chief. So we will use his, uh, his terminology. This is someone who possesses a high degree of authority both within his own village, as a function both of the hierarchy and the social rank, as well as a wider sphere of influence with tributaries in neighboring, uh, in neighboring villages. And so the mechanism that enables significant wealth accumulation to, to be concentrated in the hands of, sing, of individual chiefs is the system of patrilocal matrilineality. Because the way it works is, let's imagine here you have a village with a headman. So again, someone with a little bit more authority than others, but not a huge amount. Nonetheless, he will have certain tribute relationships with other people in the village. Remember, because that, that's how we see the kind of origins of inequality that Polanyi talks to us about. If the headman has a sister, the chief will try to marry 
the sister. The sister then goes to live with the chief because it's patrilocal. But remember, it's a uh, matrilineal system. So now the headman is contributing surplus resources into which household? Into the chief's household. And in this way, he can then accumulate inside his household all of, these, uh, all of this wealth. And since the chief, well, I think it was generally in this society, since it's a polygamous society, so you can have multiple consorts, the chief then is in a position to start marrying sisters of important people, not quite as important as him, but below his rank, important people, bringing them into his household, thus triggering this system of intensifying tribute. So in this way, the chief then can amass quite a lot of wealth. We're calling it wealth, not in a money sense. Wealth, in this case, in terms of surplus resources, food primarily, but also maybe goods and things like that. So this is the way that this system of, um, of hierarchy, hierarchy works. Right? It takes advantage of that system of matrilineality to then tie in all of these different figures, bringing tribute, right? driving production into his household to make him then to gain all this extra, extra resources. But we know from Polanyi that in systems like this, it's not just a question of wealth accumulation. You, don't just, you just don't sit on all this stuff, particularly, again, when what you're bringing into the household consists of perishable goods. It's not money. They have no money. So what do we need as a, a, as a complement to a system of hierarchy? We need a mechanism for redistributing the resources out. And that's exactly what we find, that in the Trobriand society, that the system of wealth concentration is complemented by a so-called redistributive mechanism, which we'll explore in just a moment. But essentially what it means is that under each chief, there exists a kind of microeconomy supported by the surplus resources that are concentrated inside the household of, of the chief. Is that clear? So let's take a quick look at what the Kula, the Kula ring is. Let's define the Kula ring, and then we'll try and uh, put some of these things together. So let me get my, my pen out. So the Kula ring consists in, and this will sound crazy, but it's true. The Kula ring consists in the exchange. It's an entire exchange system encompassing all the islands of the Trobriand complex that consists of just two commodities, one commodity called a Muali, which is a kind of uh, um, or a bracelet that you wear around your arm, an armlet, and the other called sulava, which are necklaces. So it seems almost like, like the kind of thing that an econo economics professor would set up as an experiment to sort of think through a difficult problem, right? A thought experiment more than an actual thing. But that's what it is. So it's just two commodities. If you think about it, what is the smallest number of commodities that you have to have in order to have a functioning system of exchange? Two. And that's all they have, just two. They don't have three, they don't have four, they only have two. It's a very curious feature. That's the first point. Second point, remember from Marx, in order for a commodity to be a commodity, it has to have utility or use value, and it has to have an exchange value, which means a commodity, a definition of the commodity is that a commodity can be exchanged for any other commodity according to some principle of proportionality. So many tables for, or so, much, so many chairs for a table, for example. Well, in this case, we have two commodities. So that means that the relationship is that some proportion of this, of Muali, is exchanged for some proportion of Sulava. You can't, as in a world of commodities, exchange something for itself, right? Because then it's not a proper exchange. This is what had confused um, Malinowski when he first got to the island. He would see these people getting together and they were trading pigs for pigs and yams for yams and bananas for bananas. What's the point? It's not a real exchange. You already own it. It's a difference if it's a banana brought from somewhere else. Maybe, I don't know, enhance the genetic variability of these, of these goods. But it seems unlikely because they were being consumed or even thrown away. So in this case, we see these two commodities. So how do you guarantee that, that you, you maintain a system of commodity exchange? That in other words, you always have an equivalent and relative value, to use our Marxist terminology. It means since it's always the direction of trade that determines right, which is the equivalent and which is the relative, it means that these have to flow in opposite directions in order for the system to work. And that's what he found. The Sulava always flows in a clockwise direction. And the Muali always flows in a counterclockwise direction. What does that mean? That means 
if you're, say, here, and you have a neighbor who's, say, here, simply by virtue of where you are in geographic proximity to each other, you know how you're going to trade. I know that I'm going to give him sulava, and I know that he's going to give me, uh, sorry, and that I know that he's going to give me Mawali, right? So it defines the logic of the trade. And that lies outside of any individual involved in the trade. That's a rule. No matter where you are, as depending on your geographic proximity, this is always how it's going to be. If we bring in more people, so if we put someone here and someone here and someone there, right? Depending on the flow of trade, it's always going to follow that logic. It's always going to be Sulaba moving in one direction and Muwali moving in another direction. So what we find inside Kula, Kula means tr exchange or commerce or trade. So the Kula ring technically means the ring of exchange. And it's referring then to this flow of, to this flow of goods. And that Kula ring implicated all, or almost all, of the islands inside the Trobriand uh, complex. There's a little detail that actually the introduction of the objects comes from outside, but that doesn't really matter. The objects that are being traded exist throughout this entire complex. And they exist both, say for example, trade that's happening within a specific island, between islands, and so on. Right? The number of people that can be involved in any particular ring uh, is open. So to be clear, you might have, I hope I'm being clear, so I might be here, and we might have someone here, we might have somebody here, we might have somebody, say, down here, right, on the same island, and the idea is we might have one system where these people are three located in a ring, we might have another system where just these three people are located in a ring, right, so you could have multiple rings, multiple concentric circles, as it were, so in theory, for as many people as there are in the system, you can, or ha divided by two, you can have that many con uh, concentric circles to the power of whatever the math is, right? So it's an enormous number of potential trading, uh, trading networks. In reality, it wasn't quite, didn't look quite like that. But the point is that you could have any number of rings that are taking place, right? Whatever it is, implicating all the different people in the inside of the system. Okay. Come back a little bit to the logic of it in a moment. We're actually going to create a Kula ring here in this class. I'm going to ask some volunteers to Kula with me. Uh, I see some excited faces, but, um, but we'll wait a moment. Okay, let's take a look at what these things are. You can see here around her neck, and again here, that is the uh, Sulava. Right? And you can see here that it's being displayed publicly. This is what they look like. This is the Sulava, the, uh, the necklace. And this is the Mawali, which is the armband, OK? <laughs> Not a particularly difficult thing to make. I mean, it looks like the kind of stuff that you might make in arts and crafts kind of thing. You find a string, you find some shells, maybe make sure that they're the same color, and little so, right? String them together, and so on. This is also made out of a kind of shell, and you can see that it, there's some stitching that holds, it, that holds it together. But we're not talking about very complex artifacts. And they're not even that rare, necessarily, in terms of their constituent materials. The things that they're made out of, it's not like digging up gold or diamonds or something from the ground that's extremely, extremely rare. The interesting thing about the Moali and the Sulava, these artifacts that we see here, where you can see it right away. Look at this Sulava, right? We can see that the, the line with this thing coming off the back. Now look at the ones that the ladies are wearing. Look at the complexity that we see up here, and look at the complexity we see on the back. It doesn't look anything like this. And one of the curiosities about the Kula ring is that as objects enter into the Kula ring, they undergo transformation. They're living objects, we might say. And the reason for that is that the ownership, remember that principle of ownership that we see at the most basic level in the household economy, that you work, but you're working for something other than just possessing what you produce, that that idea of ownership also attains at the level of exchange. So when I exchange a Sulaba for a Mawali, I don't own the Mawali that I've exchanged for. I have what I would call temporary possession of it. At some point, six months, nine months, maybe a year, I will move the good forward to the next person in my ring. Right? So in other words, these goods are constantly circulating through the economy, through this exchange economy. No one is ever just taking them and holding onto them. 
So what happens to the commodity as it goes through the cooler ring is it goes from looking like this, right, very bland and unadorned. Let me just erase my things. So these very basic things to looking like this, much, much more complex. The, so let's put that in more formally. The commodity changes as a function of exchange, right? So the commodity, if we go through the idea of having this exchange value, it has a use value. As the commodity is being exchanged, it then undergoes a transformation in what it is. And you can see here in the ladies uh, wearing their, um, wearing their uh, sulava that these are, have obviously been undergone quite a lot of changes from the very basic thing. There's a rule governing it that any new element that jumps into the exchange must be pretty basic and unadorned. So you can't, like, as it were, jump the queue by creating something like this for exchange. You only get something that looks like this as a result of the exchange itself. This, in fact, you can tell how long an object has been traded by virtue of how it looks. Which means what? It means that as the object is being traded, it's also being transformed. Who's transforming it? The people who are exchanging it, right? The people who are holding possession of it in this temporary way. And the idea then is that when you get hold of one of these things, it is expected that as part of that property of ownership, temporary ownership, that you will then transform the good. You'll add a tooth, for example, to the Mawali, or you'll add some kind of a pendant to the sulava, or you might add an extra string, or you might put a nice little shell, or maybe you put two shells, or whatever it is, right? The idea is that when you take possession of it, you are going to change the good. So that's the first important point. But the second, and this is an absolutely critical principle that goes back to the very essence of the trade. When I then trade it on, the person who gets it knows that I've put that on there. And so the story, Remember, we talked about the idea that the commodity tells a story. The story of the commodity has now been modified, or let's say amplified, to include some element of my having owned it as part of this trade, right? He's got a Mawali. I've got a Sulava. He's been doing, he's going to put this uh, tooth on his Mawali. I'm going to put something here on my Sulava. We exchange now back. At this point, when he gets it back, he will know that this tooth indicates that he was in exchange with me and that I had it in my possession for a certain time, and vice versa. It becomes part of the story of the commodity. And not just between the two of us, when we're long and dead, I hope that doesn't happen to you, Martin, anytime soon, but it will, I'm afraid to tell you, happen eventually. Don't worry. Your children will know that story too. And their children will know that story. And so these commodities will carry around with them stories that go back multiple generations telling stories. So think about it. Question. See if, you, I mean, if you're sort of thinking. What do you own? If you only have temporary ownership of each specific object, does that mean there is no ownership at all in the system? Or do you own something? The story. Well, you, you're part of the story, but I don't think that's what you own. I think you own something more important than that. What's the, where is your ownership located? If it's not in the object, Well, I would say in the exchange, right? That's your ownership. The ownership that you have is of the exchange. The object is, in a sense, just a proxy of that exchange. And so the purpose of these goods and the accumulated stories that they tell is to reinforce the ownership principle, which is that you are part of Kula, right? That's the key idea. You are part of Kula. That's what you own. That's where the ownership is located. And so as the good travels around, right, in Kula, the commodity actually takes on a different form. Let's go back to our first principles here. We see that it's, at a certain level, the most basic idea of exchange. We only have two commodities, bracelets going one way, or armbands, sorry, going one way, uh, necklaces going the other. But since the commodity is transforming every time it goes through the Kula, the Kula ring, in fact, the number of commodities is huge because each one of these has a different prestige status therefore changes in terms of its proportionality to other commodities, to the other form, right? You can't exchange a sulava that looks like, like this for a mawali that looks like this. And so that Marxist idea that we live in this world of complex commodities and tables and chairs and all the rest of it and so on, is in a way, there's a simulacrum of that idea because by virtue of the cooler ring, it's constantly transforming 
the individual commodity to create all these possible variants. And as they transform, the prestige value of owning them goes up. It's obviously much better off to have something that looks like this than to have something unadorned that looks like this. And in fact, the ownership of the objects inside the ring will tell you a lot about your standing or your status inside of the, of the society. But bear that in mind, that the ownership that you really have here, the, 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 the sense of ownership, is not of the object, but of the exchange, of the trade, being part of Kula. Is that clear? Okay, I want to move forward quickly. Let's go to, uh, let's go to the reading. Here we go. Okay, let's create a Kula to see how it works. We're going to go to page 91. First of all, Kula is for life. If I Kula with you, if we exchange, it's a lifelong relationship. That's why it's sometimes called a marriage between men. Only men can Kula. It's, it's gendered in that way. So when two men enter into Kula, it's a lifelong pairing. So that bond for life. Once you're in a Kula, it entails certain uh, reciprocal or it entails certain obligations and responsibilities. Two people who are connected to each other by Kula owe each other support. They're friends with each other. They owe each other, for example, in times of hardship or need, they will help each other out. Yeah? Um, if it's only men, then why did the women have the, um, the necklaces in the picture? Uh, why did the women have the necklaces in the picture? Wives of the chief, I suspect, in that particular case. The, la the ladies can wear it, look good, but the actual nature of exchange is in the hands of men. Good question. Um, so the point is that once you're in it, you're in it for life, and it entails certain obligations, as he says, they behave as friends and have a mutual, number of mutual duties and obligations, the degree of mutualism is a function then of, as he says, the distance between their villages, so how far apart they are, right, and their reciprocal status. If they are both of the same clan or if they're in differently socially ranked clans, etc., will then define the nuances, as it were, of this responsibility. But the basic logic is this. Once I'm in Kula with Martin, right, and my banana crop fails, I have somebody I can turn to who will help me out. And beyond that, because our families are now linked, for instance, his children and my children may have a higher likelihood, for example, of getting married and further reinforcing the union or the link between our two families. If you think about it, sin is a lifelong relationship. Once you're, once you're in Kula, you're always in Kula. If I go to Martin and I, offer, I ask him if he will Kula with me, is he just going to immediately say yes? What's he going to want to know? Who is this guy? Does he keep his word? What's his standing? I heard that the last four years his banana crops have all failed. Doesn't look like he's a very good farmer, etc. So if I want a Kula, I have a built incentive to be what? Somebody with a good reputation? Somebody who's known for, for example, good agricultural production? Someone who's known for keeping their word and the like? Which reinforces what we saw at the first part, right? Namely, people committing effort for what doesn't appear to be utilitarian benefit. But if you see me, year after year, putting up all these surplus harvests, right? And I get this reputation for being a good gardener. What does it make more likely? It makes it more likely that I'll be able to find a Kula partner. And so it builds in at this most organic level, as it were, an incentive for people to behave well. It serves, as we might say, as a social or to, to, to coerce or let's say incite, encourage, good social behavior amongst people. Because if you don't have that reputation, if I have a reputation for being, I don't know, fairly, uh, fairly unconstant or uh, not being a very good farmer, etc., people will not want to engage in Kula with me. So one of the chief characteristics of Kula at the micro level is that it serves, as it were, to reinforce certain kinds of positive self-reinforcing behaviors in the society. That's a social function. You'll note that Kula takes place at two levels. One is at the level of what he calls the average man. So people who are sort of relatively low social status, low, low in the hierarchy, low social rank. And then there's another kind of Kula, which is the Kula that takes place at the level of the chiefs. And we'll come to that in just a moment. But if it's just me, right? So imagine that Martin and I, and let's take one other volunteer. What's your name? Gabe. G Gabriel, Gabe, right? Okay, so Gabe, Martin, and I are all deciding to Kula with each other, but we're at this very low social level the likelihood is that we all live nearby, right? We're just in neighboring villages. I already know Gabe because, I don't know, his brother married my sister something or other, right? We have some connection. 
which means that we have some reason, as it were, to want to reinforce that. And so we're going to engage in Kula. That's the idea at this level. What kind of Kula are three nobodies like ourselves going to engage in? Are we going to be looking at these uh, very elaborate objects of the kind that we saw here? And the answer is no. We will be stuck with these kinds of very plain, very plain objects, right? These sort of basic, basic things, if we can get them at all. So at this low level, we're going to be down here. And moreover, our ability to adorn the Kula objects as they go through the ring is going to be fairly constrained because we're just low people. We don't have access to a lot of resources and the like. So Kula operates at this very micro level, serves to cement, as it were, behaviors almost at the village level, or I'd say inter-village level, but then allows people to sort of support themselves in ways that they couldn't do if they were simply on their own or in their own household or with recourse to their own family by implicating other people in their larger sphere. So now you can draw on resources from people, the village over and, uh, and the like. So that's taking place in a very local context. Let me put on my map. So for example, so Gabe, you're there. Martin, you're there. I'm here, right? And we have our little our little cooler ring. And we know, because of where we live, who's trading what to whom. And in something tiny little like that, it wouldn't take that long for each cooler piece to go through the ring. Each piece might go through, say, once a year, for instance, right? But remember, each time it goes through, we're constantly adding little bits to it. It may not be particularly fancy, but we're building up, as it were, memory inside of the good. Now, uh, Martin, you're going to live in a village, and you're going to have a chief, who I'm going to make green, if you don't mind. OK, there's your chief. Your chief, remember, has a lot of power, a lot of money, a lot of wealth, a lot of surplus resources. And we have a number of chiefs. Let's put them around here, for example. Right? These chiefs will cooler with each other at well, as well. And this is taking place at what Malinowski calls the inter-island level. So in other words, exchange between islands. I mean, it could also happen on the same island if you have a chief down here. But in other words, Kula that's taking place beyond or above this microeconomic level to implicate people who have a lot more resources. But the curious thing is, of course, we're still looking at the same commodity. You might be a thousand times wealthier as a chief than Gabe, but what are you still exchanging? Necklaces going one way, armbands going the other. And so what we find is that there's this moment of exchange, these basic, basic commodities, even though they're more adorned, but there's still armbands and necklaces. But then we find that there's an entire, as it were, economy that's built around the system. So let's imagine we have a ring like this. We're involving five chiefs. We know that at every point that there's an exchange, so for example, here at exchange point A, we know that this chief will bring up Sulava and this person's trading Malawi back. So the first thing to observe is when this guy wants to mount an expedition, and this is what Malinowski observed, he's going to need some boats because to get there, he's got to cross the ocean. So he's going to have to have some people do what? Cut down trees for him, dig out each uh, tree to create a canoe. And often they'll make new boats for each, koala, uh, for each uh, Kula expedition. And so he has the people who work under him, right? The people who are tied to him through tribute will be distributed in the tasks necessary to actually allow the exchange to happen. Someone goes out into the forest to make a boat. Someone goes off to like cut down a tree for a mast. Someone makes the sail. Someone makes the headboards and so on and so forth. If you have a whole bunch of people who are making these things for you as part of the exchange, as the chief, what are you going to have to do? You have to pay them. What do you have to pay them with? All the tribute that's come in. And all of a sudden, there's our redistributive mechanism, right? So the local microeconomy that's created by the Kula Ring serves this redistributive system that we know has to exist as a function of these basic systems of of resource accumulation and redistribution. So in other words, what it's saying is it's assisting or facilitating the redistribution that's taking place at this very organic level. On top of that, remember that I mentioned it's a society very much characterized by ritual and magic. Mouse, in his book, The Gift, makes the point that when I have, say, Martin and I have Adrian and Gabe, and they're all rushing around doing things to help me make my canoes, how, who gets to decide who does what? These are not particularly difficult tasks. Chop down a tree, carve out a, a canoe from a tree, build a mast, knit a sail, and so on. And what we find is that to each economic activity is linked a series of rituals, typically things that you have to say before you cut down the tree or you dig out the canoe or you start to carve the headboard or whatever it is, rituals that are then associated with an economic activity. Those rituals are curated, typically within specific families, 
So it creates a social division of labor. So it may be that cutting down a tree is not particularly complex, but once Martin knows the things you have to say before you cut down the tree, has it memorized, says it well, he's the tree cutter, even if his skill is the same as mine, because he has the necessary competence to be able to do it, linking then the ritual with the economic output. Is that clear what I'm getting at? So that, in other words, these rituals inside the society, which to immediate first glance seem to be like primitive, superstitious, whatever, and so on, but when you're actually sitting there and linking up the idea of like deer tree and so on, the spirit of the tree may it do such and such and so forth, and then you chop it down, it's actually serving this kind of underlying purpose of building in a social division of labor. And over time, that's helpful because then this person is the person who cuts down the trees, this person is the person who makes the masts and so on. And that starts to give you the kind of complexity and logic that we normally associate with the idea of a social division of labor, as opposed to a kind of generalized self-sufficiency that characterizes uh, the most uh, basic kinds of human societies. So at this microeconomic level, we see that there's this, all this production that's taking place anchored by the microeconomy enabled through this concentration of resources in the hands of single, particularly wealthy individuals. They then travel to another island where there's been a similar preparation made. Then they have the feast and all the pigs and all the stuff comes out. They all have this big thing. And at the center of it, this guy exchanges with that guy. One guy gets a necklace, the other guy gets an armlet. Or sometimes they don't even exchange. Sometimes they just meet to talk about the possibility of exchanging. Would you like to kula with me? And if you think about it, the same logic that applies when two individuals kula applies at the level of a chief. A chief isn't just representing himself. Who is he representing? His community, right? All these people who are, as it were, within his sphere. So it's almost like an international relations. Here are all the people that I represent or am, are within my chiefly sphere. Here are all the people that you have so in we Kula, what's it really doing? It's not just bringing two chiefs together, it's bringing together two societies, two communities into a form of mutual support, reciprocity, and obligation. Yeah? Why is the first one that you're going to the other island if they exchange the Malawian to Lama? Why is it going up here? Yeah. Well, so the way it would work is, you know, the problem is I'm just... Ah, there's, this whole, there's an entire calendar of exchange that's linked to this, which is discussed in the reading, and you can work that out. But yet, yeah, no, you will know, based on the rules of the system, that if you're here and this guy's here, when you're going to go visit him and when he's going to come back and visit you, right? So that's already been, that's a part of the system. But if you think about it, that ties into the larger logic of the system, which is we already know what we're going to exchange, we know when we're going to exchange it, right? So it all links together. Okay, so the point is that what we're looking at is a system of exchange which, okay, maybe it looks like trinkets, but if you think about it, there's actually something much more complex that's going on here. For the people on this island to live a, a good, a, let's say a prosperous life, it is helpful for them if in the event that something goes wrong or they need assistance or somebody comes raiding from the outside and they need protection, if they have an ally down here. And that's what this system of exchange essentially does. It creates what we might call a system of governance over this society absent, say, formal uh, governmental institutions. It links these two together. So if this island, a storm blows through and all the houses are destroyed, they can relocate down here because the chief is in Kula. And so there's that sense of reciprocity and obligation. Maybe his island got destroyed too, but that's okay because there's another guy in the ring who's over here. And so he can reach over here if he absolutely has to and receive the support. And one of the features of this system is that whereas a lot of Melanesian society is characterized by raiding parties and a kind of warrior culture, the level of violence inside and between the Trobriand Islanders is exceedingly low because they're all connected in this system of exchange, where all this interconnection that's taking place. And so it forms or it serves as a form of social order, right? Of social order. So at the most basic level, this system of exchange is, is built around principles of reciprocity and mutualism. But as we expand it out, we can see that the, the basics, as it were, of a complex system, social system, emerge in, in the way that it functions. I mentioned at the very beginning, I'm almost done, but I mentioned at the very beginning that in order for something to be a commodity, it has to have an exchange value and a use value. And it might seem that the use value is as we see it here, you get to put on the sulava or the muali and look nice and so on. 
And indeed, that's part of it, this notion. But it's not the idea that it makes you look good when you wear it, like these ladies look great wearing their sulava, but that's not, the, that's not the use value. The use value goes back to that principle we've already iterated. You grow all these extra crops, but how do you gain the use value of all that labor that you've put in? It's not through the consumption of the crops. What do you need to do? You need to make it visible, display it. And so what we find inside of this society is that as the objects of exchange go through, that whenever you have the temporary possession of these things as a chief, you put them up in front of your house. And just in the same way that people walk by and see how many yams or cassavas or bananas you've grown and they're impressed, when you walk by somebody's house and he's got 50 of these things lined up showing that he's part of how, 50 cooler rings, right? What do you think? What do you think of that guy? Yeah, a lot of That's a somebody. I should know him. I should listen to him. He's somebody worth knowing. And so it further helps reinforce, as it were, the kinds of political hierarchies that facilitate this system of interlocking mutual support. The use value of these objects is in their display. And you can see right away that the use value of this and the use value of this is going to be different, is it not? even though it's quote unquote the same object. And so as it goes through the ring, even though it's the same commodity quote unquote, it isn't. It becomes a very different commodity. And if you're in this small system, when you look at this object, you're walking by the chief's house, you'll know, oh, this means he's associated with this guy over there, this big chief. And this one was two generations ago when such and such happened. In other words, when you walk by and you see these things, what is it doing? What is the Mawali? What is the Sulava? What is it doing? As you walk by it and you see it, what's it telling you? Story. A story, right? It's telling you a story. Each one of these, all the artifacts, all the little bits of it, they're all the story that the, co that the commodity is telling you. And based on that story, out of this, this entire social system is constructed and supported. But it's not just the, it's not the story of the Moali, right? What is the story about? It's about the people in the ring. This is this chief, this is that guy, this is this person, right? Each element of the story maps onto a specific person, a specific input. That thing that disappears in the capitalist mode, in the commodity, gets replaced with price, in this mode, because of its simplicity, is highly visible. And indeed, becomes a part of the commodity itself. It's impossible to separate the story of the commodity from the commodity. And so in this regard, and I'll conclude my remarks here because I appreciate I've drawn upon your patience for too long this afternoon. But I mentioned, this is the, the sort of counterintuitive element. We look at this and we say this is a primitive product, the primitive artifact of a society that is irrational and superstitious and they worship and venerate these things and it's absurd, right? Whereas I have my computer, which is a product of a rational society and so on. It's not to say that owning a computer is irrational, but what it is to say is that we should not dismiss objects like this as being the product of superstitious irrationality. Instead, what do we have to do? Dig deeper, look for the logic of the system. And the logic of the system is commodities tell stories. In our society, the stories that they tell have been simplified so that they can be manipulated and treat us like consumers. But in this society, the co stories that these commodities tell are vital to the successful functioning of that society. When the people scattered around these different islands need to set up a system, or were looking to set up a system of support and mutualism, even though they didn't know it, it wasn't conscious, it wasn't deliberate, it evolved over time, the solution was, absent the ability to formulate complex systems of citizenship, government, adjudicative institutions, and so on, the result was, the response was, building up a simplified system of commodity exchange. Commodity exchange brings labor from here and labor from here. Remember, that's the Marxist idea. It creates social relations when people exchange. In our system, we've lost sight of that. But in this system, it's what keeps it going. It's the social relations of the system that make the entire society function. And it's in that way, it's for that reason that I make the argument to you that this is the precise definition of a non-fetishized commodity. The commodity is imbued exactly with those properties that it has and with no properties that are actually artificial to it. Okay, let's stop there. I appreciate your patience going with me longer than I meant to. Thank you so much for listening to all that. Um, 
Have a great weekend. Nice to see you. Take care. Thank you. Bye.